if you miss you're, you're gonna die and and it's it's very simple um and it's in those moments that you really have to um weigh out every single possibility as um bad as it may be What's up, guys? Today's guest is a Tempest Pro athlete who recently released his 12-minute parkour video, Skull Chatter. Please welcome to the Jamcast, Mr. Nate Weston. What's up, man? Yo, thank you so much for having me. It means it means a lot to, to be here and have a have a meaningful conversation about the, the project that is Skull Chatter. And uh, yeah, man, I'm stoked. Yeah, major, major shout out and uh, thanks to uh, Gabe Nunez of Tempest for linking us up and making this happen. It's like perfect timing with the recent release of your project. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to get him on here in one of the future episodes. He's like one of my bucket list guests. Uh, yeah, big shout out to Gabe. He's a legend. And uh, yeah, my, many thanks to him for getting us linked up, man. Hell yeah, man. And more than anything, dude, like like I mentioned off screen, this is like a super dope setup where you're at right now. You're uh, in like the little podcasting space for Tempest, it looks like. Yeah, so right before COVID um, fully hit, uh, Tempest Valley, the Tempest Valley location, was expanding into the next door um, building, um, and so they were going to knock down that that big uh, big wall, and um, it has all this office space, and they were going to build another gym, but you know, COVID happened, and so the gym just kind of stopped pretty dead in its tracks. But we still have the location, and. Um, we all come in here, get our work done. That's where I did like all my editing and everything. Um, we have this sick setup. We have like, a spring floor and uh, um, basketball hoop in the back as well. So it's a good, just like chill hangout spot. Um, and the Tempest Valley gym is just next door. Super dope, man. Yeah, I was always curious as to like where it was location wise. So thanks for uh, pulling the veil off and letting us know now. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big things coming in the future for sure. Hell yeah, man. That's super cool, man. And now obviously like the timing of this episode is is so perfect because, you know, there's a lot that I want to talk about your own personal history and how you got into the sport and things like that. But, you know, I definitely have to shout it out and talk about it from the start, which is your most recent project, which just got released on the Tempest Free Running YouTube channel for those that haven't seen it. And uh, like I mentioned at the, the start of this episode, it's like a 12 minute long uh, you know, parkour video, which is very, very unique. Cause I feel like in this day and age, we are, are used to a lot of just short form content on Instagram and little like one-off clips. Um, so can you just let the people know like how long it actually took you to shoot this entire video and uh, what was like the inspiration behind it all? Yeah. So, um, I have always, you know, there's a time and place for Instagram and for the kind of short-term gratification that that it provides in a way, you know, it's like it's a really good way to get your name out there and promote yourself and what you do and what you love to do. Um, so it's great. But for other things, like it just seems like it's not the most beneficial platform to use. And that was how I felt this project should be portrayed is like a long form video. And um, and it just felt like if I if I shared any any clips and you know kind of tease anything on on instagram before the actual full release it just would kind of downplay the actual impact that the video could have and so basically ever since february i have been saving clips um for this video and uh and just knew that it was you know meant for something bigger than just just posting a single clip to instagram and letting it kind of get you know, low key lost in the void of whatever Instagram, you know, and it's just kind of a, it's a tough thing, but, um, I'm very, very grateful to have, you know, been just kind of grinding on this project cause it's, it's been such a process and, um, I get a major inspiration from, um, skate culture and how skate videos get released because that's what they do. Like they just, they hunker down on clips for, I, one of the biggest inspiration I had was from, uh, I think it was the Baker four video. Okay. And it took them four years to make that. <laughs> so it's like, you know, they, they waited that long to make this huge part. And it was such a meaningful part that it made it so worth the wait. Um, and so that's, that's where I get my biggest inspiration um, from. And that's what Skull Chatter is. Yeah. That's super cool, man. I've, I've actually had a William Spencer as a guest on the Jamcast before, and uh, he has a project he's been working on, and uh, I think his is going on four years as well that he's been working on this new video. 
And uh, dude, that's so sick. He's gonna cap it off with one trick that he's been trying to land forever, and he's repeatedly banged his body up. He's changed locations a few times. He's even come to jam and practiced replicating the trick inside. Um, and so I know like how intense it is. Um, I had a question for you though, because shortly after Skull Chatter was released, you also released uh, Out of the Mind, which is like a short for a mini doc that kind of like details you doing the uh, side flip precision at the famous Santa Monica bars. Uh, I noticed at the end of the video, the date on that said like February, like 22nd or something is, was that what started the project? Yeah. It, it's interesting that you bring up William Spencer and, and the fact that he's, you know, four years deep and then is, is like, like just grinding on this one last huge move. Um, because to me, it was the complete opposite of that, this whole process of the project. Um, and I just was basically in my mind, ever since I moved to LA back in November of 2019, uh, I just started, yeah, like just really working on the, the side of pre from one bar to the other. And there was a perfect place to do it at the Tempest Valley gym. Um, and so I do it a bunch there and, uh, it never really felt physically doable because you know as hard as it is just doing it on one rail up at height is it's scary but the when there's something that's just kind of right at the borderline of possible like of possible it just creates this, such a good feeling of like all right like i just like i have to work on this so hard and focus so much on this one thing that it, it's a really like as scary as it is, a peaceful moment to just be completely focusing on this one thing and that's it. Like nothing else matters. You're just completely drowned out everything else and just super focused. And so that's what the challenge became. Um, and it was a, you know, I think about two or three months before I actually uh, mustered up enough courage to, to do the Santa Monica side free from the one bar to the other. Um, and I've uh, elaborated a bit on it before, but I'll, I'll you know, do it say it again where it's like i would always i would go to santa monica and probably a handful of times every week just to go and get up on top of the rails and do the process of just the setup yeah. up until i did side and just seeing how it felt and i remember kind of the internal feeling of um telling myself like all right like what would it feel like if this is the one i'm gonna commit right now and i could feel my body just like tense up and just freak out and it's really, and, and in those moments I knew like, okay, like I'm not trying to, you know, psych myself up into doing this thing. Cause it's a super mental challenge. Like physically it's not terribly difficult. It's just super mental. And so I didn't want to commit to it unless my mind and body were in sync or what they felt like it was in sync. Um, and so, yeah, it was a whole bunch of times just going there, walking away, going there, walking away. Um, but each time I walked away, you know, low key kind of felt like a, uh, a failure in a way like god damn like i didn't do it like shit um but every time i walked away there was a little piece of the puzzle getting solved in my head and i could visualize this thing way more and more and and it got to the point where it was like building up and building up and um it became less of something that was scary and unknown to just completely like i i, I can do this like i'm just gonna do it and the moment i had that kind of thought it just went from like, you know, that, that really like anxiety inducing feeling of like, Oh my God, I'm going to do this to just complete calmness. And it was like the most surreal feeling. Like it's so hard to explain in words, like how sure I was that I was going to do it and how everything was going to, you know, no matter what, if, even if I bailed it, I was just like, I knew I was going to go for it. And like that kind of a hundred percent commitment is what, makes that challenge so special to me and the fact that it's you know one of my favorite one of my favorite kind of um mentalities is one that paul white cotton would talk about which is like if if there's anything in in this world that people want it's it's inner peace and it's at being at one with your surroundings and with everything and to me, I've always had that in my head and, I, and I've always been chasing that, I think. And I think that's what everyone wants. Like everyone wants to be, you know, that's why we, that's why we do things that we love is because we want to be at one with, with what's going on. Um, and so to me, the challenge is so special, not because of, you know, it's a cyber precision across the famous, you know, Santa Monica bars or whatever, like I'm stoked on it. But the thing that I get so much more value out of is just the, the meaningful moment that it was and, yeah, it's hard to fully kind of explain that, but 
I'm just so grateful to have like experienced that 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 whole day and just the way it went. Um, and thankfully, it went it went went over well. But yeah, the out of mind video is uh, it goes into more detail about the whole kind of process of it. So if you're interested, you should definitely check it out if you're listening. Yeah, man, uh, that's super surreal too for you to mention Paul Whitecott and, and his mindset because I've known Paul since he was like a 15 year old little kid, and uh, he's like my little he's like my little brother basically, and uh, yeah, it's so so surreal. I, I know exactly what you're speaking about and that feeling inside uh, that a lot of people who are listening may have experienced at some point in their life, but it's kind of like you're saying it, it's something that probably won't be able to be put into words until people get that own personal uh, feeling from doing something and accomplishing something on their own. And uh, in, in Out of Mind, did you actually detail all of the attempts? Was it only four attempts it took to do that, or was there more attempts off camera? Yeah, it was only four attempts. Um, from the very first send to uh, the last one that I did, the, the kickback to double fly away, it was about 10 minutes, um, which is it's, it's such a weird thing to think back on, too, because it just feels like it's hard to remember specifically the whole like that whole 10 minutes um because it just like not that i blacked out but it just felt like it was just completely there's nothing going on in my head besides just this one thing and um time goes really really slow so it did not feel like 10 minutes it was like wait it's already done like it's just such a weird thing but but yeah it was only it was only four attempts thankfully um and i only had one close call where one of my feet um kind of slipped off and I like was really on my toe with the other foot. Um, cause that's definitely the worst case scenario is if both feet slip. Um, and the more times you, you know, do something with that level of precision, um, the more times you're kind of not rolling the dice, but you know, there's more of a chance probability of you slipping and messing up. So glad it only took four attempts. <laughs> Yeah, 100%. I know what you mean. Like the, the more attempts, the, the higher the risk factor just from a sheer numbers perspective. Um, but yeah, man, for like you said, for those that haven't seen it, go check out the Out of Mind short. It's a really cool uh, like perspective. And it, it, I like liked hearing your like way of explaining how you went about it and obviously the process with it. Uh, but one of the things that intrigued me the most, I think, about the entire project and going back to Skull Chatter as a whole was uh, you put out an Instagram clip um, or more so like an Instagram post where you explained kind of the state of your mind going into that project. And uh, I don't want to like take the words out of your mouth, but I know specifically you uh, had quoted like an Alan Watts quote uh, that was really cool and it's very impactful. It even is at the start of the video itself that plays out. Um, but could you just maybe like give a little insight into like what was going through your, your own personal life during that time period? Yeah. Um, and so to go back to, uh, to go back to um, when I first moved to LA, I think, um, in my head, I was really putting a lot of pressure on myself and it wasn't from anyone else, but it was just from me being like, all right, like I'm moving to LA, I'm trying to make it work. You know, it's like, you know, expensive to live here. Um, and I just, I just want to like do stunts and I really want to, you know, make it work because this is like a childhood dream. And, and, and I really kind of had that thought circling in my head. And um, in the past, I've always been able to, you know, it didn't matter what, kind of training session it was it didn't really matter if i had a training session it felt like i was completely shutting off these overthinking negative thoughts and i was able to kind of get a, a reset um from those thoughts by training and then all of a sudden after i moved to la it felt like i just couldn't get out of that mindset of like that pressure of i was putting on myself and it really put me in a rut like it was like it's so hard to explain now because like I, you know i think i think in life there's things that come in waves and sometimes there are really low moments but those build up to really big moments um and in the in as shitty as it felt like how bad i felt like i was you know my life was going i just was like in such a negative mindset i knew that if i could do this santa monica side pre it would like get me you know out of this funk and into this next project because i think for me I, I definitely work way better by obsessing over a certain thing or project or or training stuff, whatever it is like if i can just kind of dive into something head first and just like only have this be my focus it it just yeah it drowns everything else out and that's a my best way of kind of doing work um 
and I remember in the funk, like in in the rut that I was in, um, I remember trying to listen to you know as many different you know kind of opinions and, and beliefs and just kind of seeing what actually resonated with me. Um, and Alan Watts, I remember from the past, I've heard of him in the past, and I just went back to some of his some of his talks and um and yeah he had that famous quote about overthinking and you know how someone who's overthinking all the time has nothing to think about except thoughts and you're really taken away from reality in a way because you're just so in your head and and i'm i'm definitely the type of person to you know i'm, I'm way more quiet um more reserved as a person and for for whatever reason that is i don't really know but i definitely get caught up in my head very easily um, and so I, I, I definitely, that hearing him say chatter in the skull, just how it just kind of hit me. And I was like, all right, like this seems like I need to, like it, it hit me so hard. I need to, I need to make a project, like a meaningful project dedicated, dedicated to this period of my life that, you know, and it makes, makes it so much more meaningful. It's, it's not about just the movement. It's about you know, the meaning behind it. And that's, to me, is what is a defining um, characteristic of a, of a person as an athlete, like what, what their deep down motivations are, not necessarily what they've accomplished. Um, because, you know, when it comes down to it, anyone can accomplish anything if everything goes their way. It's the people that, you know, really persevere and push through these really hard times. Um, and so I just felt like, I had to give it my all and and um, and really dedicate this towards that mentality of of overthinking and all these thoughts that were really negatively driving my life in a way that I just could not stand and um, and yeah it, it's uh, it's really crazy to look back on because it feels like another person like th- this time last year I was in the worst state I've ever been in and then now coming out of it after this whole process i'm like the happiest i've ever been it's such a funny contrast <laughs> yeah man no uh, and it's super cool I, I really think that it's uh you know really meaningful and appreciate that you're like so open about sharing that stuff because i feel like mental health and well-being is something that's so far overlooked especially in a community that's so like based upon physical appearance and you know physical prowess and stuff like that i feel like a lot of other people yeah. within our community probably face the same things that you're going through. And so to hear someone like yourself speak about it, I'm sure it'll affect a lot more people than, uh, than you can even imagine yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. Because I mean, that's, and it would be so frustrating because I would see, you know, online and all my friends being like, you know, super like, like from the outside, it seemed like they were doing great. Everything was awesome. Like their life's going amazing. And I look at myself and I'm like, Dude, I'm just like in this fucking like, pit and I can't get out of it like what's going on and just to to let people know that you know there's like, you're not alone and, and everyone has these kind of thoughts some may be more severe than others but you know these kind of overthinking thoughts happen and and to me it, this whole project and the whole process of this project really made me realize like uh, these kind of thoughts don't just go away um, and they shouldn't because if they did, then it would, you'd be a completely different person. And to me, not even a person, because that's the whole thing of, of human emotion, human beings in general is like, is this wave of emotion and you have highs, you have lows, and that's what makes us human. Um, and so it just, it feels good to have the, to ex- have the experience of this whole year to really see the contrast and to understand that the contrast is what gives you life, not the highs. Like that's not the whole point. Um, and to understand that. And then, you know, I know like it's a, it's a cycle. Like it's the, like there will be hard times coming up in the future. Like I'm not, you know, dwelling on those moments, but I'm just mentally preparing because I know that once those kind of happen, you know, brings down a little bit and then you're able to appreciate the next great moment because that's what gives you the appreciation for it. Um, and so in a way it's, it's given me the tools to battle that next, that next thing, whatever it may be. Um, and that's a really empowering feeling for sure. 
Yeah, it's, it's so unique how you speak about it that from the outside, you know, you have, we have friends online that I, you know, I'm even guilty of this myself where I look at other people and you, you start to compare yourself and you wonder like, wow, you know, how is their life so great? But all we're seeing is like a brief moment in time and what they choose to put out to the world and stuff like that. And to me, I think it's so crazy um, because I know like probably it was, it should have been probably one of the best times in your life in the sense that like, I know in the middle of November, 2019 is when you were announced as a Tempest pro athlete and you made the decision to move to Los Angeles. And so from the outside perspective, I'm sure kids around the world in our community were thinking like, dude, Nate's made it, you know, like he's a Tempest pro and he's going to move to LA and pursue his dreams. He's probably the happiest he's ever been. And then to hear, you know, your inside perspective of what you were dealing with mentally and all that stuff is just, uh, it's really cool to, that you're able to like share that and hopefully like lend itself to some of these younger kids listening. Yeah. And, and that was the, the main focus of, of the whole project is, you know, again, like I'm not, I'm not one to really be very open and, you know, talk about my feelings, I guess, um, more, I'm definitely more reserved, but, to, to have it kind of this talk coming through the project and having the project be a means to, you know, express this kind of, um, this kind of idea and all these, all these things is such a healthy thing. Cause you know, um, you know, I think the, the best thing is just to talk about, um, these kind of things and, and to know that, you know, it's, um, it's just a common thing. Like it's not, it's not just you. And, um, yeah, it's nice to know that you're not alone. Hell yeah. And now like diving deeper, like specifically into skull chatter itself and stuff like that. Uh, whose choice was it to, uh, do the majority of it in black and white? Cause that's one thing that I really, really enjoyed about it was that you kind of removed all of the, uh, you know, distractions from like bright colors and all this stuff. And we just really focused on the beauty of the movement. Was that like a directorial choice or something you always had in mind? Yeah, yeah. So I edited the the whole video, um, and uh, that was the biggest thing is is the black and white decision. Um, on one hand, it was a creative decision in a way that uh, you know, black and white, yin and yang, love and hate. Like, there's these, you know, there's the, the contrast is what gives you this, you know, life. Um, so there's one for a little like backstory, I guess, or meaning behind the black and white decision. Um, but the, the biggest thing was, um, the fact that the whole project over the past nine months has been, um, filmed on iPhones, um, GoPros, Sony's, uh, reds, you know, all these different cameras with different camera qualities and whenever, and, and different, you know, color as well. Um, and at, the amount of matching all the colors and uh, worrying about the quality of the footage. And so I just was like, all right, if you just do black and white, it, 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 for some reason it just kind of takes that aspect of, out, of the, out of the picture and you can just focus on the movement itself. And that's the whole point of, of the black and white um, decision. Yeah. Okay. And I love black and white too. Yeah, I, I just love black and white. Art- Artistically, it looked dope. But yeah, did to hear about the color correction and color matching, that makes a lot of sense, honestly. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's cool man and now just like kind of about like your own personal journey like I kind of uh you can correct me if I'm wrong now but I believe you've been doing this sport for like eight years now and I only say that because I've chronicled and followed all your videos and specifically you put out videos that were called you know five years in 2017 six years in 2018 which were in reference to the amount of years that you had been in the sport so um how did you actually get into parkour and free running and has it been I guess eight years at this point that you've been involved in the sport yeah, it's been eight years since I like really was like, all right, parkour. I'm, I'm doing parkour. Um, but the backstory behind that is is interesting too, because I grew up playing basketball, soccer, and uh, baseball ever since I was like four until I was about eleven or twelve. Um, so I was always like a really active kid, and I have three older brothers, and always had a backyard trampoline. So we were always just up to something, and just you know messing around on the trampoline, learning how to do flips and stuff. Um, and I, I remember getting kind of bored of just the classic, you know, basketball, soccer, um, team sports. And I wanted to do something more, I guess, creative and, and just expressing myself in a, in a better way. Um, and I remember started to, I do, uh, to do circus classes to learn how to do like juggling and, you know, tightrope walking and trapeze, all these just, you know, cool little ways of expressing yourself. And I had a really good time at that, but I really, I really wanted to do acrobatics. Like I was like, I love back handsprings. I love flipping so much. Like I did on my trampoline. I want to learn how to do it on the ground because that's like the coolest thing ever. 
Um, and I remember my circus coach was like, well, I think you should do gymnastics because, you know, circus is more, you know, we're, we're more focused more on like the well-rounded, you know, doing everything. But if you want to just do like acrobatics, like, go do gymnastics. I was like, all right, that's a good point. And I went to gym um, in Washington where I'm originally from. And uh, so I did gymnastics for about, about a year, year and a half maybe. Um, and it's such a weird thing to look back on because like I remember being so stressed out and I just like, yeah, I just, it's such a weird thing because I was 12 and 13 years old. Like <laughs> I'm a 12 or 13 year old kid just like freaking out about competition and like low key, like superstitious about all these things. Like, oh, I gotta make sure like everything goes right or like, you know, it's just such a funny thing to look back on. Um, but I did gymnastics for a bit and then I quit thinking that I just didn't want to do it anymore because the stress was really like getting to me and I just was like, ah, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and so I kind of went, I left gymnastics and then I played basketball and soccer for the first two years of high school. And again, just kind of felt like I was missing something inside, like something wasn't right. Um, and I was like, you know what? Like I still had a trampoline in my backyard, so I'll just, I'll, I'll try some stuff. I'll just mess around, like learn how to do double front flips again and double backs. And it was like, yeah, this is like, a, I was like so much happier just like training on my own and just doing things that were scary. And then like, you know, it just became so much fun. And, and the kind of the, the love for movement really started there. And I realized it wasn't gymnastics that I wanted. It was, it was just movement um, and parkour ultimately. Um, and I knew what parkour was kind of ever since about 2011, I think, or 2010, even when I did gymnastics. Um, and I remember always being like, no, you can't, like, I, I can't, I couldn't do that. Like, you know, in gymnastics, you have, you got a spring floor, you got a trampoline, you got, you got like all these things to help you kind of, you know, get the, the distance or get the height. Um, and I always thought it was impossible or ridiculous and never really thought I could do it. Um, I just slowly kind of transitioned from trampoline to my grass to using like mats and then slowly kind of building up and up and up. And, um, yeah, ever since about the fall of 2012, which yeah, makes it about eight years now, um, is when I like really picked up parkour and, and just stuck with it. And here I am now. That's crazy, man. It's so unique to hear like each person's background and stuff like that. Um, and I was always curious, like what sports you had done previously because your body, the way that you move now, it just seems like it's literally built for parkour and free running at this current state. So yeah, it's really cool to get a perspective on that. Uh, and with that being said, like in your early years of parkour and stuff like that, like where were you training at and were you training solo most of the times or like what was really part of your foundational process of getting into parkour? Um, I really started tra first year or two was um, training just solo and just figuring out, you know, what this thing was and watching videos and being like, oh, it's such a funny thing to, to look back on because I've watched Eric McCommission and now he's my teammate, which is so freaking weird and amazing. Um, but I'd see this dude, you know, he had like the white mohawk and everything and he'd do like castaways and stuff. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to learn how to do castaways, like all these things. And, uh, and so, yeah, the first few years is just, you know, no, no real mat. I mean, a little bit of mats, but like nothing, nothing really. It was just like all grass, backyard stuff, um, just figuring out what was going on. And then I had a friend who, um, who like they knew I trained, and um, I, I live, um, I live on Vashon Island, or I lived on Vashon Island, which is in Washington, and um, it's a small island just off of the west, uh, just west of Seattle. Um, you have to take a ferry every time you want to get there. It's not like a tiny island, but you have to take a ferry, so it's kind of isolated. And so I'd always be just kind of on my own, just training by myself. Um, and they, one of my friends said that there's a, there's a parkour gym in Seattle. Like, like, you know, we should go sometime. And I was like, yeah, that, like, that would be amazing. Let's do it. Um, and so that was Parkour Visions. Um, ah, okay. And that was back in 20, uh, winter of 2012, 2013, I think. Maybe a bit kind of fuzzy on the date of that. Um, but I remember going to the gym and going to an open gym and just being like, this is insane. Like I had just watched a team Ferrang documentary or like a travel, like the X tour video. And, uh, Yoan LaRue was living in, uh, was living in Seattle at the time. So he was at the gym and he had a huge team Ferrang logo. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like it's such a, like a small community. Like how are like these insane people just here? And I just, I, I've been training for so long and 
not so long. I've, I've been training this long and didn't know this was right here, basically like in front of my face. Um, and so once I, once I found that gym, I just would go every day, basically. I, it was a long, a long commute. It was about an hour and a half, two hours each way. Um, but it was so worth it because I just, you know, that was like my second, second home. Um, and met some of my best friends there and, and, uh, really made some great connections. And, um, yeah, that was, that was like the start of it. And Park Provisions was the, was the gym and they were the, the ones that got me started. Yeah. Man, that's so surreal. It's, it's always funny to hear when uh, guys discover that they had something in their own backyard that was so close to them. And, uh, you know, Park Provisions yeah. is obviously a staple of the community. So it's super cool. Um, and then, you know, just along the lines of that, um, I remember for a long time, a lot of the footage that we would see of you was coming out of like unparalleled movement and stuff like that. Uh, at what point did you like start training over there? And like, what was the backstory on uh, getting to like use that facility for so long? Yeah. So, um, so in 2015, um, unparalleled movement would host, uh, these jams called pools gym. Um, and it was every April, April, April 1st. Um, and uh and so 2015 I, I me and my friend my close friend from from seattle who i trained with we were like all right we're gonna go to we're gonna go to missoula and and that was like my first proper like trip um you know with not none of my family um and for parkour and uh it was a big like learning experience for me because i was just like i felt so uncomfortable traveling and looking back it's so crazy because again it's a completely different person um and just really connected super, super well with the people in Missoula. Um, and after 2015, I, I always try to go back every, every chance I could get. Um, and it just slowly kind of, you know, I became like really, really good friends with everyone out there. Um, and then in 2018, I knew that, um, Seattle wasn't really like doing it for me. I just, I needed something more or I needed something different maybe. Um, and Missoula's door was kind of open and, and got the opportunity to, to move out there and um, be a part of that, that whole organization and, and go train at that gym for a good year and a half, two years before I, I moved out here. Um, but yeah, that gym, I mean, it's sad because, you know, COVID, COVID's taken a toll on, on everyone, both big and small um, organizations. And um, so sadly, their, their gym is closed. But um, that was one of my favorite gyms for sure. And yeah, it will always be a, a memorable place to me. Hell yeah, man. I, I, I remember watching tons of level ups and just continual footage of you just throwing out bangers and increasing your skill level over there and stuff. Um, and so with that being said, like for our viewers now that, you know, sit back and watch these long projects of yourself and they see like the end result of like all the insane precision and, and things that you're able to achieve with your body. Uh, how much time like were you putting in training like on the regular? Like what was your normal training schedule like? How many days a week and how many hours per day were you putting in? Um. I think uh, I think it's due to gymnastics and how like strict um, it used to be when I would train. Um, I, I try not to keep too much track of like, all right, I'm going going to the gym this day, tra- training for three hours, two hours, whatever. Like really, like strict training. Um, and and I love the. I remember Dylan Baker talking about this um, back in like 2012, I think. Um, but people would always ask him, like, you know, like, how are you so good? Like, it's like you just seem like you're always good at everything. Like, it's so insane. And the one thing he said was that I really was inspired by was I just go out and I train what I see and I and I just do that. Like, I just like do what I want to do and do it to the fullest. And then that like that's that always has stuck with me. And I kind of and I try to, you know, I think it's a balance. Obviously, like you don't want to be lax a days cool and just like not do anything like cons- like you know constructive. Um, but on the other side, you don't want to be like this completely like not driven, but just completely to the point of just doing this one thing um, and being super strict on yourself. And I think it's a balance. Um, I think there's a time and place for for both styles of training. But for me, I definitely get more out of training when I um, go out to have a session just because I want to have a session and not really have much in mind, um, you know, for whatever that session should be, um, and kind of have the door open to possibilities. Um, because I think the more, the more expectation that I would notice, the more expectation I would put on the session, 
the worse it felt. <laughs> uh, and but given though it's like you know the Santa Monica side pre there's all these these like to me very big moments where you have to work up to those moments and you have to train your mind and your body for those moments um and, th- and that's a different situation but just on the regular i would just go you know uh, I, recently it's been like three to four days a week of just like training just you know go out have a session and then also doing like other stuff like skating or playing basketball or lift, wh- like lifting lifting weights um and but yeah it's not 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 too much of a strict uh schedule it's just kind of kind of open <laughs> No, that's super cool. And now you just kind of like alluded to it, you know, where obviously there's certain things you build up to like the Santa Monica side flip precision and stuff like that. Uh, how are you able to like overcome fear when you get to certain obstacles that, you know, do and in- invoke that feeling within you? And is fear something that you, you constantly battle or do you think you're at the point now where you're able to ca- kind of override that just through the years of experience and practice? Yeah, um, I definitely, it's funny i had this conversation with someone recently where i'm like i'm scared of heights but i can train at heights which is really kind of it may sound strange but it's so true it feels so like and and i think it comes from you know as as hard of an experience as gymnastics was for me as a kid like you know it was so stressful and stuff i learned some really good lessons there and i remember one of the most just like the, the most memorable moment from learning how to do a giant, which I was absolutely terrified of. And I remember like my coach could see it on my face or I was like, I'm not doing that. I can, I can't do that. Like that's, that's like nearly impossible. Like there's no way. And he, I, I wasn't saying that, but I, he could tell that I was freaked out. And the one thing he told me was, all right, well, we're only, what we're going to do is I'm not going to make you do anything, but we're going to prep it every day for half hour, hour, just prep it over and over and over again over and over and over again until i guess the point where you're so annoyed by prepping it that you just you're gonna want to do it yeah and and that like really like it it was a big impact and and i and i still have that kind of mentality where i don't force myself to do anything that really feels wrong or i'm scared of um but I just go through the motion, go through the motion as many times as it takes in a way. Um, and that's why it took so long to, to build up to the, the Santa Monica side period because, you know, I was going there, walking away after prepping a bunch, walking away, getting there, you know, all these days of just prepping it out, but not actually doing it um, really was what got me to commit. The, um, and yeah, I think I, I definitely, I value people who look at a challenge and they say, no, I can't, I'm not doing it enough. They look at it a bunch and they say, no, and they walk away. Um, but they know that it's doable and they walk away temporarily. And to me, that's, that's the mark of someone who really thinks about, you know, training and especially at height too, when, you know, one of the most, um, skip- I think from from chatter was the the Nordstrom Kong precision from one parking garage to another rooftop, and you know that challenge. And it's if you miss, you're you're gonna die. And and it's it's very simple. Um, and it's in those moments that you really have to um, weigh out every single possibility, as um, bad as it may be in a way for me i think of it as like what are all the things that could go wrong and you have to kind of to me i try and look at each possibility and wonder how i could react to those moments i feel like the moments that when things go wrong it's when you're unprepared yeah. and you don't know how to react and so in these moments where you have to be really on point and very focused you um you think about everything and it's like how alex honnold would say is people would say like you know when he's pre-soloing like aren't you afraid you're gonna die and like isn't that crazy like don't you ever think about that and he's like yes all the time <laughs> like you have to like you have to think about every possibility and and some people might think it's kind of crazy and and yeah it's not it's not fun to to have those kind of thoughts but when you're doing those kind of challenges you really have to take a moment to think about everything and and know your motivations behind doing that challenge as well. Cause that's another thing. Um, 
are you doing this challenge because there's cameras here and all this thing to post on Instagram later, or are you doing it because you really want to do it? Um, and having those thoughts about, you know, motivation and why you want to do it are really important. Um, and just to kind of steer away from the whole adrenaline, psych yourself up, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to do it. Like, you know, that, that's to me is like kind of scary to watch. Um, and it's the people that can really kind of slowly and methodically work through the process are the ones that I, I value a lot for sure. Yeah, that made, that makes a lot of sense. You definitely like, like you said, like you, you have to, it's funny that you're scared of heights, but you're able to train a heights. But I think it takes like some level of respect in order to even do that and attempt these things because it's the times when you don't respect things and you get cocky and confident where like, usually, like you said, the worst things happen when you're unprepared for it. So, Oh yeah. It's like, that's like, I swear nine times out of 10, the worst injuries are from people who are warming up and walking down the stairs or doing like the most basic thing because your mind is so in a rhythm that like you're not even thinking about it. And then all of a sudden you have a, a misstep and you roll your ankle and boom, you're out for five months. You know, it's like, there's all these things like that can happen. Um, and so to be just hyper-focused, you know, as dangerous as it is, you know, there's a difference between risk and consequence. Like the risk of, honestly, the risk of missing that Kong precision is pretty low. Like it's a, it's a big Kong precision and it's kind of hard, but you know, if it was at ground level, it wouldn't, it would be cake. Like there would be no, like there would be no second thought. Like, Oh, this is a perfect Kong three. I'll do it. Um, and, but the consequence is extremely high. And so that's the, the balance you have to kind of figure out. It's like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do something that at ground level you would miss every time and do it up at height where the consequence is extremely severe. Um, and so that's the whole kind of thought process that I go through when I do these kind of challenges at height is just making sure everything is dialed and everything is for sure. Because again, it's, it's your life. Like you don't, you don't want to take it lightly. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. And now like, it was kind of funny is like you referenced that, like, you know, you felt like an extreme amount of pressure back during your gymnastics days as brief as they were. And you're definitely like, you know, you've mentioned like a very soft spoken person. And so I've always wanted to like ask you this, which is, um, what got you inspired to make the jump into doing competitions? Because in my mind, that's like really putting yourself out there on like a gigantic platform to not only be judged, but to be open to a lot of risk factors as well. And, uh, obviously, you know, from someone that's competed in multiple sports myself, like that's honestly the most stressful part of it. And it's not something that's required within our, our community of parkour and free running. So what was it that got you to actually make that step and commit to competing in so many of these different, you know, competitions around the world? Yeah, I think I was definitely really hesitant at first. Um, the very first competition that I competed in was the style comp in, uh, uh, NAPC in 2015 and I remember it being kind of a trial run like you said like the competition was what made everything kind of go screwy with me in, in gymnastics it just like made everything super super strict but the difference was just the way the competition was run I think it was it was less about like what I would put on myself and it just felt like everyone at that competition even the judges were there out of passion not out of like you know, this is a job, like we're doing this thing and just doing it to like, you know, everyone was there because of like, they wanted to be there and they were supporting everyone. And it just felt like it didn't feel like a competition. And I think that's why it was such an easy transition back into kind of that competitive mindset. And again, it like, yeah, it wasn't like I was going against other athletes. It was like, it was just me versus me. And, and you know, the, the beauty of competition to me is, is putting yourself on the spot and seeing if you can, you know, show up when your name is called, right? Like when you have to throw down and when you have to do this thing that you planned out, when you have to do it, are you going to be able to do it? And that's a really interesting thing to kind of be comfortable with, especially at height too. It's the same thing. It's, there's this thing that I'd have to accomplish and it's a very, it's a very good learning experience as a person to figure out what you're, your limits are and what you're comfortable with and and competition is a very very simple way of kind of getting into that that cycle of of thoughts and just kind of seeing where you where you place and where you you know 
your skill level is and, and how you really are comfortable with your training and where you're at. And it's, a, it's just a really good scale. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely was a bit hesitant at first, but you know, after that competition, I was like, this is just fun. Like, I just want to travel the world, go to Red Bull, do all these amazing competitions, see my friends and go to different countries. And just was like, yeah, it was completely a different feeling than the gymnastics kind of competition for sure. Okay. Okay. And now with that being said, you, you've actually like, you know, met some, some very decent success in a lot of people's minds. You've made the podium at like, you know, Lion City Gathering, NAPC, Apex International. Uh, I was even a sideline reporter at the Red Bull Art in Motion 2017 when you got second place. Um, is there a competition that stands out in your mind as like one that you're most proud of? And uh, do you think you'll continue to compete for the duration of your career? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm in a weird place right now with competition where I um and not to say that money is the reason you compete um, or the motivation to compete, but it feels like I've had some success in the past and now it feels like I'm in a way, I'm not competing against myself anymore. I'm competing against my past success and seeing how I live up to those, you know, those high moments. Um, and it's become like this thing where it feels like if I compete in a style competition, I have nothing necessarily to gain and everything to lose. Um, and it just kind of feels like a weird role. It just, yeah, it kind of, it kind of flip flops all of a sudden. And now, now I kind of feel like the most stressed if I was to compete, which is kind of funny. (laughs) Um, but, but like in the past it was great. I was just like, yeah, we're just like going with, let's go with the flow and see what happens. And, um, but yeah, it, it seems like now I'm, I, and I think it's because also, um, when you kind of gain experience in anything and that no matter what it is, you kind of, you develop this ego, right. And, and you kind of forget the whole, your, your mindset of who you were as a beginner. And like in those first few years of competing, that, that was the mindset I was going into it. It was, I have nothing to lose. I'm just, I'm going in here and I'm, I'm just showing what I've got and that's, and that's it. And there's nothing to lose. And, and then all of a sudden the, the past year, it just felt like this ego was kind of creeping in and it was like, I have to get podium cause I've gotten podium the past three years in a row. Like all these things and these thoughts come in and then just, they just ruin it. You know, like it's just, it's such an interesting thing. Um, and so I think, I think I'm taking a break from style competitions for now. Um, you know, nothing, nothing too set in concrete. Um, but I really want to get back and do some skill and speed competitions because that's the, those are the two other aspects of parkour where I, I love training those, those aspects, but I never competed it, um, for some reason. And now I can kind of, you know, maybe put aside the, the style competition for now and, and really jump into skill and speed with this beginner mentality of just, I'm just going to do what I want to do and just see what happens. And, and like, and all is good, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just an interesting kind of, um, thing for sure. But I think the most, uh, the most memorable one was, uh, either the Red Bull Demotion in 2017, um, the one that I got second at or the, uh, competition in China in, um, Hefei city. Um, that one was a really cool song. That was such a sick experience. And, and yeah, it's like, those were sick experiences because I got a second in both those competitions, but just in general, all, all across the board, the, the, the vibe of, of both those trips was just so good. Um, that, that made up for, you know, way more of the memorable moments for sure. Uh, That's super cool to hear, man. And now, you know, from someone that's, uh, you know, like we said, kind of getting away from style competitions and things like that. And obviously you're a Tempest pro. Um, I know this is a question that a lot of kids out there have, especially as they continue to put in hours and hours of training themselves and stuff like that. Um, Are you able to make a living being a parkour athlete right now? And in general, what is like the ultimate goal of your career and what you want to take in the next few, uh, you know, steps in your life? Yeah, I think um, right now it's just parkour and uh, stunts as well. Um, the the thing that I've kind of realized, and I don't want, I don't want to, the sport is very young, um, and it's it's definitely hard to make a living just doing parkour because you know there's not much of a an industry behind it in a way. It's like you know we just have clothing and that's basically it. Like you don't need a skateboard to go skateboard, you know, you, or to go 
training. Like you just need a pair of shoes and just to go use your imagination. Um, and I think I've kind of in, in the past, I had the mentality of like, I just want to do parkour. Like I don't want to do anything else. Um, and if I do anything else, then it's like a failure in a way, which is like holding myself up to just such a crazy standard. Um, and expectation and it just was you know in the past though, i realized that i think you know I, I want parkour to always always be the main passion in my life and it always will be um and i i really want to find other avenues that you know can be related to parkour whether it's doing like stunts is becoming now my my uh like most interesting thing that i want to pursue outside of parkour because it's such a it relates so closely to parkour um and it's uh definitely um a fun thing to kind of experience the whole you know it doesn't have to be parkour like it, it, i always want i always want to train parkour forever but it doesn't have to be like i have to make my living doing parkour um and uh that was another thing that i kind of wanted to experiment with skull chatter and to have it being a uh, you know having a clothing line and all these things that people support the project with and just to see kind of how um, how possible it might be to you know do these kind of projects in the future and to to get some funding to keep those kind of projects going um, and it's definitely interesting to see that whole kind of process you know firsthand now because this is like one of the first times I've ever been in um, you know in a relationship with a business that we are we're selling clothes. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, it's not like we're making like a lot of money or anything. Um, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but it's just kind of a good reality check of, all right, you know, there's other things that I'm going to have to do to, to, to get, you know, get by. Um, but I think no matter what, just do what you want to do, 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 do what you're passionate about. And right now it's parkour and stunts and, um, and I'm just going with that and just seeing where the road takes me. Um, I think the, the the hardest thing is to not limit yourself and in, into you know it may seem like you're you're going towards this one goal and like that's it um, and that's great but in a way you're also kind of closing some other doors or potential doors that could be open um, and so that's where I am right now it's you know I don't I don't see a, a, a grand future in parkour for me financially. Um, and that's okay because I think in a way that there's some beauty in that in a way. Um, and I'll just be doing it for the passion and um, just figuring out other ways of, you know, doing it. Um, but yeah, just, it's all learning experience, man. It's all, you know, that's all it is. And being in LA and, and pursuing this dream is, uh, has been a really, really good experience and um, excited to see where it takes me for sure. Hell yeah. And uh, not to put any undue pressure on you and stuff like that, but I feel like I'd be you know, remiss to not ask you this with the obviously recent release of Skull Chatter. Uh, do you have any future video projects already in mind or are you just at a place where you're just glad to have accomplished that one right now and just waiting for something else to inspire you next? Yeah, I think I'm more waiting. Um, I, I know there's going to be another project for sure. Um, and again, I'm not trying to to formulate an idea already and just have something like, all right, like we're doing this next thing right now. Um, and I'm kind of just waiting for after the holidays are over, um, to really start like training again. And, um, I'm just going to go see fam because I've been in LA, all my family's up in Washington for the most part. And so I'm going to go home and, and see everyone and just kind of get some family time, which would be great, especially in the times that we're in. Um, and so, yeah, once, once that's all done, it'll be great to kind of come back and back into training and just, you know, brainstorm my ideas because this has definitely given me another boost of just passion for parkour and i just want to keep creating things and meaning, meaningful projects like this um and so yeah there's definitely more coming out in the future um for sure but right now it's it's the door is open for for possibilities for sure dope okay and to kind of you know sum it up and bring it all full circle this is something i ask everyone that's a guest on the show before we get out of here which is uh where do you personally see yourself five years from now and then where do you see yourself 10 years from now yeah that's, that's it's a it's a it's a thought-provoking uh idea to think about yourself five years from now because again five years ago i was just a completely different person like 
I was scared to, to travel to another state in the U.S. and and now I've been to across you know the whole world and it's such a funny thing to think back on. Um, and so who knows five years from now? Um, I'd like to I'd like to be in a place where I can um, financially be comfortable to to keep doing projects like this kind of out of my pocket to pursue this meaningful thing that that I hold very close to my heart. Um, and it just, yeah, just my biggest thing is just trying to, um, have a good impact on people and, and, um, you know, life is short and I want to experience it in a way that is meaningful and not just at a nine to five job. So trying to figure out the way to do that properly. And, um, yeah, just want to, you know, have a good experience in life and, uh, just hold people close that I find dearest. Um, and yeah, nothing, nothing too set in stone. I don't think just kind of, yeah. Seeing how, seeing how it goes. Hell yeah, man. Well, uh, I'm definitely intrigued and interested to see where the, uh, the rest of your personal journey takes you. And I'm sure everyone listening and watching is, uh, is on the same page as me. And, uh, you know, more than anything, dude, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, come on here and share your perspective and uh, also, you know, speak about some topics that I think are a little far too overlooked, especially within our community. So thank you. Dude, yeah, I appreciate you so much for having me on and it's been an honor to, to be here and chat. It's been a good, good chat. Hell yeah, man. Uh, so before we get out of here, can you just let people know uh, where they can continue to stay up to date with your own personal journey and, and follow you uh, as well as the team? Yeah, so my Instagram is uh, Nate, um, Nate underscore Weston, and uh, my sponsor, Tempest Free Running, it's on Instagram and YouTube as well. Um, and again, we, we have uh, a whole pro team, and, and we have many projects you know coming out in the future, so there will be more. Um, and yeah, I'll keep keep up to date on my uh, my end of the of the journey. And um, but yeah, that's that's where it is. Yeah, Nate Weston on Instagram, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Perfect, man. So, you guys, with that being said, please be sure to hit that like button, comment, and subscribe for brand new episodes each and every week. Join us every Monday for Jam Breakdowns and every Friday for brand new Jamcast, interviewing influential members of the movement community like Mr. Nate Weston himself. So, that being said, I got to give one more very special thank you to Nate. Thanks for coming through, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Have a good one. I appreciate it. Hell yeah. And as always, guys, coming at you, coming through, I'm your host, Travis Wong. Thanks for joining us here on another Jamcast. Until next time, we'll see you all soon. Peace. We'll